Christmas. Um, we're so excited that, uh, that you're here to worship. Um, and I just want to draw your attention. Um, we do have some candles down here. If at any point during the service you'd like to come up and light a candle um, as, a, as a memory, as a, um, as a Christmas prayer, you're welcome to come down while we're singing or at any point in the service and, and light a candle. Um, and I also want to welcome those um, who are viewing online. Um, I know we've got many people that uh, can't be here with us tonight, and we're so excited that you're here with us as well. Um, so as we begin worship, I'd like to uh, invite the Convery family um, as we light our Advent candles. When we wait in the night, in the hush that only stars can hold as they bend toward the coming of the light, may we hold our collective breasts with the angelic hosts as they clutch their restless alleluias. For God is on the way, the mother is laboring, the father is pacing, the stable readying, the world is waiting, the light is shining, and the promise is breaking through. In expectation of good news, may we choose to wait together and find we have moved to the edge of our seats, for in such anticipation, it is the only place for the word to be born among us. Tonight is the night for which we have all been waiting. Our Advent wreath will now be completed by the lighting of our Christ candle. you to stand with us as we worship God in song. you to remain standing as we uh, hear from the scripture.
first scripture reading tonight comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. The word of God for the people of God. Our second scripture reading this evening comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. 
So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The word of God for the people of God.
One of the ways that we worship as a church is by joining together in communal prayer. Today we will be using the Prayers of the People format, which is marked by moments of silence interspersed throughout the prayer. In each moment of silence, you are encouraged to lift your own silent prayers to God. At this time, I would invite you to join me by preparing yourselves as we approach God in prayer. Good and gracious God, on this holy night you gave us your Son, the Lord of the universe, wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. On this holy night, draw us into the mystery of your love. Join our voices with the heavenly host that we may sing your glory on high. Give us a place among the shepherds that we may find the one for whom we have waited, Jesus Christ, your word made flesh, that has come to dwell among us. On this holy night in which God joins heaven and earth, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all those in need. Let us pray for the church around the world as it celebrates the birth of Christ. Bless all those who are entrusted with Christian ministry, that your word might be proclaimed with truth and courage across our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bestow your wisdom on all who govern, that in honoring the earth and its diverse races, cultures, and religions, we may celebrate the light of this holy night. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant reconciliation to those surrounded with conflict and violence, that they may live in the peace of this holy night. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are cold, hungry, or alone this night. Embrace with your tender care all who wander alone or have no place to lay their head, that they may experience the hope of this holy night. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are anxious, depressed, or ill. Draw near to those who find this season a source of pain or grief, and to all who are suffering or sick, especially those we remember in our own hearts, that they may feel the comfort of this holy night. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for parents, families, and newborn infants. Strengthen families in the bonds of love and commitment, that they may delight in the joy of this holy night. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for ourselves and for the blessings of Christmas. Open our hearts to your presence, that we may be transformed by the new birth of this holy night. In the name of the one who came to be with us, we pray. Amen. I invite the children in the congregation to join me up front for a story. Behind me or beside me, Eliza? Wow, we have lots of friends tonight. Can we find room? There's room up here so you can see. This book is called A Christmas Tree for Jesus. Oh, cool. A Christmas tree for Jesus. Yeah. Whispers of excited voices float into the mouse family burrow. Curious little mouse pops out of bed. 
What's going on? asked Little Mouse. Some of our forest friends are choosing the tree we will decorate for our Christmas celebration, Mama Mouse explained. The Mouse family isn't the only one up and about. Now that everyone is ready to greet the day, who has ideas how we will decorate our tree this year? asked Grandma Turtle. Let's make it all purple, suggests Little Hedgehog. Oh, I know, a cookie tree, shouts Little Bunny. What if we each add an ornament that celebrates something amazing about Jesus, suggested Grandma Turtle. Everyone thinks this is a great idea. Chatting excitedly, the friends scurry and hop and fly home to get started on their ornaments. But Little Mouse walks away slowly, quietly at the back of the pack. We say. The next day, the decorating team gathers at the Christmas tree. Who's ready with an ornament? asks Grandma Turtle. Some friends jump up and run to the tree. But where is Little Mouse? I brought a fish because Jesus made two fish and five loaves of bread to feed more than 5,000 people, said Little Skunk. This manger reminds us that Jesus came to earth as a tiny baby, shares Little Bunny. Here is a sheep for Jesus, our shepherd, says Little Chipmunk. The next day, Little Hedgehog adds a crown for Jesus, King of Kings. Little Raccoon shares a butterfly for a new life found through Jesus. And Little Bird brings a small bouquet of herbs because Jesus heals. Little Mouse feels worried. What can she offer? She's still thinking. What's wrong, asked Grandma Turtle. I have no ornament to share, Little Mouse said. I don't know what to do. Grandma Turtle puts her arm around Little Mouse. Let me tell you a secret. One of the most amazing things about Jesus is that he is with us today and every day. Just then, Little Mouse gets an idea. As his friends call after him, he runs home to get to work. Little Mouse works the rest of the day on his ornament and a surprise for his friends. The next day, Little Mouse can hardly wait to put his ornament on the tree. Show us, Grandma and the friends encourage him. I made a heart because it's so amazing that Jesus loves me, knows me, and came to earth for me on Christmas, said Little Mouse. And that's true for all of us. So I made a heart for each of you. The Christmas tree is ready just in time for our birthday celebration for Jesus, said Little Mouse. And you've already discovered the best gift. How Jesus knows and loves each and every one of us, said Grandma Turtle. And I brought something for you Got everyone. to take home to put on your tree so that it reminds you that Jesus loves you. So you can take that home. Thank you. You can go back to your parents. Merry Christmas. Good evening, once again. Um, first of all, uh, many of you know Amy um, actually spent a couple nights in the hospital last week. Um, she was having some issues with some dizziness. Um, the doctors have told her that it should go away here soon, so we are expecting that it's not anything um, uh, that should be too much of an issue. However, um, she really wanted to preach tonight, and um, she decided that she should only try to preach one service. And so I told her, I said, I'm happy to preach for you if, uh, if you only want to do one service. And so she said, okay, we'll have you do the 6 o'clock service. And so I agreed to that, and then I realized, I think she chose that service because now when she's preaching at 8 o'clock, I'm going to be putting two young kids to bed on Christmas Eve. <laughs> so thank you, Amy, you won that round. Now my question for you is, what is your favorite story? 
When I was growing up, my mother read a lot of science fiction novels and fiction novels, and me, being a teenage boy, often made fun of her for that. Um, she read books about elves and wizards and dwarves and weird things. But then one day I came home from college and my mom wanted to go see a movie. And I hadn't seen her in a while, so I said, okay, I'll go. We're going to watch a movie about wizards and dwarves. Um, and we went and saw the first Lord of the Rings uh, movie. And my mom had read the books. I had no idea what was going on. Thankfully, she sat next to me and explained to me the difference between wizards and elves and stuff. Um, so I watched the movie and I thought, okay, that was, that was not as bad as I expected. Um, it was all right. So then the next year, the second movie came out. And I thought, okay, I already saw the first one. I might as well keep going. Um, and I found out that I really liked the second one. And I was really into the story at that point. So then the third movie came out. And I had some friends in college who really liked it as well. So we went on opening night. And I promise you, I did not dress like an elf or a dwarf or a wizard. At least that anybody can prove. But it was just such an incredible story. I was drawn into it, the characters, the conflict, just wondering, are they going to make it? Of course, I hadn't read the book, so I didn't know. But it was a great story. And I believe that our brains are hardwired for story. Story is incredibly powerful. It's the way that we learn almost everything in life. The beliefs that we have about the world, how it works, how it should work, what it means to be a good person, what it means to fail, to persevere, to encourage. I believe that we learn all those things primarily through story. Stories that we're told, stories that we see others living, and stories that we live out ourselves. Our very lives are telling stories to the people around us about what's important, what's worth living for. How do we respond when we see failure, when we see discouragement? Our lives teach us, or teach others around us, what we value. Now, Amy, uh, if you've heard her preach before, she's often talked about how she's a After the story of Noah's flood, the author doesn't come in and say, well, here's what you can learn from Noah, and here's how you can apply it to your life. No, instead, when the story's over, he just picks up and starts writing another story. Story is so powerful on its own. And so tonight we've gathered here to hear the greatest story ever told. And that story doesn't start in Bethlehem. It doesn't start with the prophet Isaiah. It starts way back in the book of Genesis. When God, for whatever reason, decided to create humanity in his image. And any story that's worth telling involves conflict. And of course, we know that humans decided to rebel against God. We decided to go our own way. Even creation itself feels the effects of those decisions. Now, if I were God, I would just start it over completely. We'll keep the puppies, everything else goes, right? But instead, God made a promise to humanity that someday... He will make things right. 
And over hundreds and thousands of years in Scripture, we see whispers of that promise to come. A promised land, a temple, words from a prophet. But still, the promise seems a long way off. When Israel is completely overrun by oppressors, that promise seems all but dead. For 400 years, from the end of the Old Testament, and so the very first words of Matthew, 400 years, there were no words from God. There were no prophets, there were no visions, there were no dreams. And honestly, if it were me, I probably would have given up at that point. But when everyone is about ready to give up, God makes an announcement to a priest by the name of Zechariah. And he says that in your old age, you and your wife are going to have a child. And that child is going to be named John, and he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, have you ever seen one of those movies that has like 10 plots going on at the same time in the main plot? Like, I think of the movie The Avengers, where there's superheroes all doing different things, and the movie just cuts to different perspectives and different parts of the story. And when I read the gospel account of Jesus' birth, I'm kind of reminded of that kind of story. Because there's so many different perspectives of what's going on that night. I think of Zechariah and Elizabeth. They had this incredible experience of, of having a son who would prepare the way for the Messiah. Yet the Bible says when they were made that promise, they were very old. And those are the words the scripture uses. So it's very likely that they never actually got to see John grow up and baptize Jesus. Their part of the story was just knowing that their son would someday do that. I think about Joseph and his role in the story. He made a difficult choice to stay with Mary. He got to experience the incredible birth story of Jesus. But then we read in the Gospel of Matthew how he had to take his family and flee to Egypt because of the persecution that was going on there. Then we meet the last that we hear of Joseph was when Jesus is 12 years old. He takes him to the temple. And that's it. That's the last we hear of Joseph for the rest of his life. Most scholars believe that Joseph died before Jesus ever became a man. And so his role was just knowing Jesus at the very beginning. Now, the shepherds had what I think is the craziest experience of all. They were out in the fields at night. They were minding their own business. And an angel appears to them. And the scripture says they are terrified. Absolutely terrified, which is exactly what I would be. And the angel tells them not to be afraid. That the Messiah has come, and they will see... It's my own. Oh, there we go. All right. That they will see... Uh, I'll use this mic. So that they will see a sign of Jesus lying in a manger. And uh, the, the part that I missed in the scripture reading, that I just some, somehow focused on this week was it says that suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God. So they get this message from the angel, and it says there was a great host at that time that appeared singing praises to God. Now, I don't know how many a great host is, but I can imagine that as they're looking up in the sky, their faces are just lit up with the brightness of this angel and these, these great hosts praising God. And, and I also love the way that Luke ends it. He says, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another. So there's not like a transition. Like, they're up watching this, and then it's gone. And I just wonder what the shepherds did at that point. Like, I was talking to Amy about this this week, and she's like, you know, it sounds kind of like they saw a UFO. Like, they were looking up, and it was there, and then it was gone. I just wonder, who is the first shepherd to speak at that point? You know, like... I, like, if, if it were me, I'd been like, guys, I think I forgot to take my meds because something's going on here. That's a moment I would have liked to see. And so as we reflect on this story, we know the shepherds didn't really have a major role. They heard the announcement, they went, they saw the baby, and that was it. I also think about two elderly Jewish people who loved God, and they were at the temple about a week after Jesus was born. Simeon and Anna. And while they were there at the temple, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus. And the Holy Spirit spoke to them. They said, the Messiah is here. And so Simeon, in his old age, found this baby at the temple who was being um, circumcised, dedicated to God. And he said, I can die a happy man now because I have seen the Messiah. And that was it. That was his experience with this infant named Jesus. 
there are so many different perspectives to the birth story. What did the wise men think about the star? Why did they follow it? What about King Herod? What did he think? He found out from the wise men what was going to happen. And he started to kill babies because he was worried that there was a new king that was going to take his place. Did you know that there's even a heavenly view of this story? Um, while the rest of the world saw a silent, holy night, heaven's perspective was much different. And we see that in the book of Revelation. I'm going to read this to you. Revelation chapter 12. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who would rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled to the wilderness to a place prepared to her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. So that's kind of the Lord of the Rings version of what was happening. While the world saw this peaceful story of a newborn baby from heaven's viewpoint, it was war. It was a cosmic D-Day. You see, from the beginning, since the Garden of Eden, when, when humanity fell, Satan ruled this earth. And yet in this moment, God said, I'm going to step in and I'm going to take care of this myself. And so he stepped into what had become Satan's territory. God himself to make things right. I think the biggest mistake that we can make with the Christmas story is to think that it's the whole story. Or to think that it's even the end of the story. Now, the, the Christmas story is a big part of the story. But there's a lot left to come. And of course we know that Jesus would grow up. He would go to the cross. He would re resurrect from the dead. But even today, the Christmas story continues. Like any good story, there's an ending. An ending that hasn't yet come. We believe that one day Christ will return to earth. And back then people were expecting a king, but they got a baby. But in the end... Christ will return as a king. He will bring justice and righteousness. He will make all things new. There will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears. That's how the Christmas story really ends. That's what our hope is. That as we celebrate this baby tonight, that someday all things will be made new. You know, I have a, a friend who um, was given some old letters from her grandmother. And the letters, it turns out, were from her grandmother's grandmother. So they were older letters and she learned about things that she never knew about her family. Um, and that started her on a path. She did the, the ancestry DNA thing. Um, she did research on her family's history. She went to libraries. She went to museums. And she even spoke with long-lost relatives she didn't, never even knew she had as she went down this path. She discovered that she was actually related to this French king from the 1600s. And she found out that a few hundred years later, her family had escaped persecution in Europe and come to the United States. She found that she was actually related to John Rockefeller. And those were just a few of the highlights. And as I heard her telling me all of these things, I realized that she wasn't just telling stories about other people, that this was her story now, that this was something that she was part of. It informed who she was, it informed uh, where she was from, and it informed where she was gonna go, all because she was part of this larger story. And so I hope that this Christmas we hear the story once again. I hope you tell it to your friends, your family, your children. But understand that the greatest story ever told isn't simply a thing of the past. It isn't something that just happened a few thousand years ago. It's something that continues today with you and your family. And just like Mary and Joseph and the shepherds all had their roles in the story, you have a role in the story as well. God is inviting you not only to remember the story, but to be part of it. I someday believe that we will all be at, at the feast table of Christ with saints who have, have died many thousands of years ago and everyone in between. And that we'll be sitting around a table and we'll be talking about how our, the threads of our own stories were, were uh, weaved in to the greatest story ever told. That this story of Jesus wasn't just someone else's story, but it was something we were all part of. Let's pray. 
Dear God, I thank you so much um, for your story. Uh, I thank you that um, you came, that you uh, came to this earth in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our um, tragedy, uh, God, and that you invite us to be part of it. Uh, Father, as we reflect on all the different perspectives of the Christmas story, God, let us be reminded that you give us our own perspective, that you call us to be part of your story today, tomorrow, and until you make all things right again, God. We look forward uh, to seeing the end of the story, and we thank you so much for our part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to, to stand with us as we uh, worship God in song. This is a song that uh, you probably know the hymn. Um, there's some new lyrics um, that are focused specifically on, uh, on Christmas.
coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward as we prepare for our candle lighting. Amy and I were talking a little bit about the candle lighting, and I was thinking about it, and I, I realized that in the midst of so many of our different Christian traditions, this is one of the few things that almost everywhere in every church tonight across America and in many parts of the world, that the church is doing the exact same thing, singing Silent Night as we light candles. And it's just a reminder that this story is so much bigger than just this church, just this country, and we celebrate Jesus around the world. Oh, mm -hmm. 
grace has been given to us. From a stable in Bethlehem, our Savior has come. Now go into the world sharing the good news. The light has come. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.